coming up on this episode of Common Denominator. All people have to do is ask themselves how well they take a compliment. Because when someone says, wow, great job, how many people are like, oh, it was nothing. Man, no, really. I, you know, I had a whole team that supported me on that one. And really what we should be doing is saying thank you. Hi, and welcome to Common Denominator, where we shine a light on people striving to make the world a better place. Today, key brain hacks to greatly enhance your life. Larry Olson is a performance-driven neurology specialist who is on a mission to vastly improve and redefine the art of living. By understanding the brain's role in accelerated performance, Larry can help you unleash your innate ability to achieve personal and professional success you never thought possible. Larry and I just had a mind-blowing conversation, pun intended, and the thing that really stuck out to me is how important and critical it is to have a positive mindset. I know for me, our brand is hashtag positivity and to live with a glass half full mindset, it really shapes the results in each of our worlds. So enjoy the conversation because I really enjoyed the interview. Hi, Larry, and welcome to Common Denominator. Well, hi, Moshe, and thank you so much for having me as a guest. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you. I know for me and my personal journey, I love and I'm fascinated with the human brain. But for you, this is kind of your profession, what you do. What fascinates you the most about the human mind? What fascinates me most is when we when we discovered plasticity and we're able to break away from, gee, I'm sorry that's not working out for you. You know, you were born that way and you're going to have to just deal with that for the rest of your life. We've got such a marvelous tool, all of us, and yet so few people know how to use it. So it ends up after being programmed through society using people. And um, <clears throat> my fascination is, is not only understanding more about its magnificence, but assisting others in kind of breaking away from these ingrained habits and attitudes, beliefs and expectations that are not allowing them to basically, if you will, not to use the bumper sticker kind of slogan, but be the best version of themselves they can possibly be. Yeah, I think um, it is not, I know you say it as a, as a bumper sticker slogan, but if each of us were able to reach our potential, because I think that right? It's personal growth and development. That's, that's the way I see it in this world. I mean, what, you know, what else is there? We're here, we're here to grow. Um, and the way is to be the best version, but it probably does come from, you know, from the mindset. I know, um, I know in some of your talks, you talk about performance driven neurology. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, performance-driven neurology is basically a, a blending of neuroscience and cognitive psychology, allowing us to better understand why we do what we do, whether it's good for us or not. And, you know, this whole concept of utilizing our full potential, um, we all have our full potential, but unfortunately, we have allowed what's happened to us to begin to define us instead of defining us first and then bringing that to to the circumstances we find ourselves in. I, um, I discovered a long time ago, and uh, I think it was in grade school, um, my father really became a part of my life when I was 14. He had three businesses for himself. They were all struggling. So he was gone before I got up in the morning and he, he was, I was in bed before I got home at night. But they were having this Christmas pageant and we were going to be able to sing to our families. And we'd been practicing for about a month. And my dad really had never really had the opportunity to participate in many events that I was in. So he was going to be at this. And I was pumped. And so <clears throat> just on our last practice and the parents are starting to arrive and the music teacher looked at me and she said, Larry, could you do me a favor this afternoon? And I go, yeah, what would it be? She could, tonight, could you just mouth the words? And Moshe, when she said just mouth the words, I realized that she just told me I can't sing, that I'm not a good singer. So 
you can you can probably imagine what it did to my spirit and my esteem and you know kind of the creation now of of who I was because here's an expert a music teacher giving me this proclamation that I'm not a good singer so I mouthed the words and and my dad came up to me afterwards and he goes god you sounded great larry and i think anyone who's ever cheated on a test or has taken something and plagiarized it or given credit for something they don't deserve, it, it doesn't make you feel any better about yourself because we know who we are. Or I, Let me rephrase that. We know what we've become. Very few people know who they are. And if they did, they would be living a life of absolute magnificence. You know, it's so interesting. So, I was just saying, you know, just on that point, knowing who you are, that just really struck a chord for me because... Every time on my birthday, and I, I, I've said it before on the show, uh, you know, I have 10 kids, and that's all I wish is that I have to just stand there with unconditional love and for them to figure out who, who they are. And that's so interesting that most people don't know that. But I guess I'm going to try to get my kids to that place. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it was just something so, that really resonated. So I'll, I'll, I'll make this you know, long story interesting, if nothing else. Um, you, you know, so so what I did then is I went uh, through life compensating. And it's amazing how many people don't know they're compensating. You know, they, they'll look at a weakness as being something that limits them rather than an opportunity for growth. And so not knowing any better, I went through life avoiding any karaoke opportunity in the evening. Any time anyone said, do you want to sing? You know, I was not. I was mouthing the words at birthday parties where everybody's singing happy birthday. Ultimately, I'm teaching school. And this is 15 years later. Um, and it's a it's an it's an event that they're having on Friday night where all the school teachers in the district are all getting together. And guess who's there? You know, my old music teacher. And she walks across the auditorium, walks up to me, and she goes, Larry, how's your singing career going? Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> ow, I thought that was pretty sarcastic. And I said, what are you talking about? And it's amazing, neurologically, we, we remember, excuse me, we have stored everything that's ever happened to us in our lives since we popped out of the womb, we're finding out now that we're storing information inside the womb. But beyond that, I had remembered this because what we have stored is not only what happened to us, but more importantly, our interpretation of what happened to us and the emotion. The emotion is as strong as it was up to this moment, as it was 15 years ago when she made that comment. So when she said, Larry, how's your singing career going? I said, what are you talking about? You told me I can't sing. And you know what she did? She started laughing. Mm. And now, now I'm really upset. And she goes, I said no such thing. I said, tonight, Larry, would you mouth the words? Because, Larry, not only were you the best singer that we had, you were also the loudest and I wanted the parents of the other children to be able to hear their kids as well. Wow. Oh, she, I went for 15 years operating on the worst and possibly wrong information. And the question I always ask others is, how long have you been going operating on misinformation? Yeah. And I, that was one of the elements in my life that got me curious about neurology, how our brain works, and and how we can recreate ourselves in any scenario. That getting stuck is just a, a mindset that people believe. And once you believe it, you fire dendrites, they connect together, and now you have a neurological pattern, which we call an habit or an attitude or a belief. And once we do that, our brain's designed to only provide that information and that's what they mean when they say you'd rather be right than successful, that we have got to maintain sanity. And so we continue to see a world that is only matching up to the belief system that we have. And all people have to do is ask themselves how well they take a compliment. 
Because when someone says, wow, great job, how many people are like, oh, it was nothing. Yeah, no, really. I, you know, I had a whole team that supported me on that one. And really what we should be doing is saying thank you. But we have such a, a high bar set for ourselves and without knowing it because of our upbringing and our society and, you know, learning that first test we got back in school at everything circle in red, we did wrong. We were nurtured at a very young age to focus on what's wrong. And that in itself keeps people from being in any danger of fulfilling the potential that they were given when they popped out of the womb with the magnificent brain that they have. And I think, I mean, I always hear about reframing. I've kind of synthesized, um, you know, in other words, we live, we live here, we come and we go, and we're here a short period of time. And I think of like reverse engineering, if results in this world, you know, getting positive results, whatever it happens to be for each one of us, and what is the thing that kind of stops us? Um, I've kind of synthesized it as, um, like, you're, you know, you had a certain perspective, and then we have to reframe that perspective, right? So it's like guilt, fear, shame, or trauma. In actuality, in our internal brain, it, cause, it seems to me, because I've broken it down that way, at least in my life and people that I speak to, that they stop people from action. So if we can neutralize those things and get people to act. It seems, it seems so hard for people to make decisions and act. I think something's going on, it starts from the mind, right? If I, It starts yeah. from the mind, a certain programming. So how do we get more people, like you're saying, to live to their potential, to negate these neg this negative programming? What is the actual protocol? What's, a, what's an actual practical daily thing that people can do to produce better results for them and people they care about? Which is, a, which is a great question. And <clears throat> what I have found in my own life and with working with other individuals is they have to recognize that awareness is the first step. I have to be, I have to not like outcomes that I'm getting. And instead of going, that's all, it's always happened to me. I've always been that way. no, that's the belief that you have and your belief was developed you weren't, weren't born with the belief let's get that real clear it's an attitude and an attitude when people ask themselves you know well what's an attitude well it's how you respond to things automatically without thinking about it and attitudes are learned behaviors you're not born with them and yet, by the time a child is about 10 years of age, they have over thousands of attitudes, you know, from food to smell to music to taking parents' advice to you name it, we've got an attitude. And since we're all looking for performance, that's how we judge ourselves. That's how we evaluate ourselves is what's happening in my life as a result of me being an influencer and a part of it. Is that performance, and I've asked people this, what percentage of your performance do you think is dictated by your attitude? Now, not something you're born with, a learned behavior. And the answer is 100%. It doesn't kind of affect you, it dominates. Mm -hmm. So if this is a learned behavior, we can unlearn it, and we can put in the new behaviors that we want, the new actions that we want to take, and the way we do that is you certainly don't get up in the morning asking yourself if you got enough sleep because most people never get enough sleep. So if you say you're tired, you're going to go through the whole day and your brain's going to go out of its way to make sure you're right about being tired. So one of the first things in the morning is to read the script, to begin to look at the outcomes and the behaviors that you want. For instance, if you're a parent, how are you going to show up at breakfast? And just don't show up at breakfast because you might decide you don't like what was fixed or you don't have anything to eat or whatever the scenario may be. Instead of imagine how you want to show up at breakfast, because then that's what you're going to do. If you say, I'm going to say, I love you, dear, mm. you're going to walk in regardless of the burning sensation you smell or how bad you feel or you didn't sleep at all. You're going to follow directions. Our brain is a servo mechanism. It responds totally to how it's been programmed. 
And when people understand that, they stop relying on past programming. Yeah. I think I, I, I think a lot of awareness, right? It's like, I don't like this result. I think, and then you're like, okay, what do I got to do that that thing, which I don't like, um, you know, won't, won't happen. Like, you know, just something, something for me, I was telling my wife, um, you know, it's been hard. It was just like, you know, I'm trying to get more in shape and, um, you know, uh, and I had a certain, I guess, relationship with food and it was a certain, um, I guess habit. Um, maybe when I'll be nervous or something that I would want to eat certain food. Now, what I'm trying to solidify is I need to have clarity. I need to have high energy. There's a lot of things going on in my day. I, I know I don't feel good when I eat that. So now when I look at the food um, that it used to be just a few months ago, look a certain way. Now I'm like, okay, that's not something I want to feel. It's like kind of like change the way I think about it. You bet. You bet. And now we're getting into motivation. We're getting into intrinsic motivation. What drives us? And 95% of corporations and 95% of fee- people are driven by fear. Mm. Has a lot to do with our amygdala, our reptilian brain, because we're protecting ourselves. We store a little information. How'd that go? Next time the scenario creates itself, we go, oh, that made me feel this way last time. And we don't develop the, a new reaction. So 95% of people are motivated by fear. Now, fear is not someone holding a gun to your head or a Bengal tiger chasing you. Fear is showing up to a meeting because you don't want to be disrespected. It's it's Fear is simply a sense of loss. So why do people care about that? Well, if you're interested in performance, do you know how much of our potential or our performance we're able to utilize when we're motivated by fear or avoidance behavior, Maji? Do you have any idea? It's probably super low. I wouldn't think. Uh, it's less than 10%. Yeah, yeah. And that becomes the model that people are modeling themselves after. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to eat that anymore. I'm not going to. Well, now there's another motivator and it's called value. Hmm. And value is when you're changing the reward. If you if you're getting a reward from the ice cream or the alcohol or whatever it is that you are trying to move away from. You need to change the reward. The trigger is going to be the same. You're in a situation you want to relax. You want to you want to be comforted or like you talked about certain foods, you know, blah, blah. Uh, if you don't change the reward, you can't change your brain. So now instead of going for the dessert, I have done reading and I recognize that broccoli, for instance, you know, now I may have a, a immediate attitude that <laughs> dessert tastes better than broccoli. I may have that attitude. But what am I trying to accomplish? And that ultimately be, has to be a stronger driver. I want to be a lean, keen change agent machine. I want to be someone that makes a difference in life and is a model of someone who is maximizing this once in a lifetime opportunity. So as I condition myself through meditation, through vision statements, through me saying on purpose and in writing it down, journaling, or however we take a time out. I don't care what you call it. You take a time out to decide how you want to be instead of keep reacting to situations to have things not happen any longer to you that were painful. By the way, I want to also talk about fear for a second. What okay. percentage? What percentage of fear... Because if 95%, and I think that this is hopefully very valuable if we try to use our logic, the things that we're fearful about, how much, what percentage of them is actually a real thing that we should be concerned about? Or is it really just something that just pops in our head and and actually dominates us? Is that, you know well, what I mean? Less than 1% is real. Mm. The rest is illusion. It's made up in our own mind. If I'm I'm chatting with you right now in the studio, if that door f- flies open and there is a man-eating tiger who hasn't been fed in a week, that's fear. Mm. If I'm imagining 
what could happen? What could go wrong in this podcast? What if I say something stupid? What if I, what if the lighting goes down? What if my mic doesn't work? That's all made up in my mind. Now I'm looking at in, in this whole thing about worst case scenario, what's the worst thing can happen? Yeah. Make sure you're covering for that. Well, what happens to a human being when they go through life with what's the worst thing that can happen? They're under stress 24 seven. And stress is not a positive thing. And so instead of I'm doing this so this doesn't happen, I'm doing this so this wonderful outcome can occur. I'm making sure that lighting, I got a backup system. And the reason I do is I want Moshi to be the most amazing looking dude on television, on the podcast. That's why I'm doing it. This is something, this is the biggest killer in America today is heart disease. It's over does can over outdoes cancer two to one. And the number one cause of heart disease, as you know, is stress. And in America, stress is known as the silent killer because there's no Bengal tiger around. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're imagining job loss. We're imagining, geez, why did my wife say that? We're imagining, am I leading my kids in the wrong direction? You know, instead of time out, which is what you got to do. You got to do that to your brain. Why do I want to do any of this to begin with? And boy, if you can't come up with some value, then stop doing it. Yeah. And really, the only thing we have to do in life is die. You know, everything else is a matter of choice. I mean, you don't even have to change a baby's diapers. Oh. They'll eventually fall off. But then you go, but I don't want to live like that. Well, how do you want to live? Well, I like my child to be healthy and I like them to smell good. And I go, okay, they, then shut up and change their diapers. You don't have to, you want to. And that is such a wonderful thing to be able to turn have tos into want tos. And that's by asking yourself, where's the value? And that, remember, we use less than 10% of our potential. We would get 10, less than 10% of what we're going after when we're motivated by fear. Well, it's not 90% we get when we're motivated by value. It's a symbol and it's called infinite. We still do not know what we're capable of. We only know what we've been able to accomplish up to this point in time. Wow. I love that. Just a quick reminder, this is the Common Denominator Podcast. If you're enjoying this episode, we'd be grateful if you can leave us a five-star rating and review and subscribe to our YouTube page if you haven't already done so. Thanks so much. Now, back to the show. I also have, you know, my meditations and yeah, I found it super important to journal, and uh, I know that positive self-talk, you know, it'll, it'll be strange, right? You're talking to yourself or you're writing to yourself. How important is that to constantly bombard, I guess, your dendrites in your brain with positive self-talk? How important is that? How important it is, is it to you that you enjoy your life? Hmm. How important is to you that you have maximum health? How important it is to you that you, you feel good about who you are, no matter what the circumstances you find yourself in. And I think that it's kind of like that old uh, MasterCard commercial, you know, the answer was priceless. I mean, you cannot put a price on our own health and our ability to look forward because that is something that we didn't have to learn when we were a kid. You know, if I knocked on your door and we're both five and I go, Moshe, you want to go out and play? What are you going to say? Let's go play, right? Let's go play. Let's go play. Now, at 35, at 40, I knock on your door and I go, hey, Moshe, do you want to go out and play? You know what most people's response is? Well, what do you want to play? <laughs> well, how much is it going to cost? How much time is going to be involved? Yeah. Where did that entrepreneurial spirit go? And I'll tell you, people misunderstood responsibility. People misunderstood accountability. They didn't recognize it was things that they chose and that they look forward to. They looked at it as, I have to be more of an adult now. Yeah. I can't be childlike any longer. You know, well, that's a lot of fun. I'll tell you, I love, I love that you're saying <laughs> that. Cause when I look at, um, uh, you know, my, my kids and the creativity and I think of, you know, we own some assisted livings, you know, seniors and, I'm like, they're just having, it's like a park cruise ship, you know, they, you know, it's great. They have happy hour, going to bingo. I'm like, wow. I'm like, this is the way it's supposed to be. And then 
and then when you see that little glimpse, like I'm 43, and you see the little glimpse of like, of like, of like people my age just kicking back, having a good time, you know, going to a concert, whatever they're doing, I'm like, that's actually what people want to do. Somehow, like you're saying, right? We've been put in this way, and it's the kids and the and the seniors. They're right. They're right. It's all the crap and the things that we have in our head, which is actually not right. It's actually not right because it leads to stress. And like you're saying, heart disease and not a happy life. No, so, no. Uh, Age onset, diabetes. You know, I mean, there's a multi things that, that too much stress yeah. does. I mean, there's you stress, EU, which is, you know, is Greek, excuse me, Greek for, for good stress. Yeah. Um, but it's got to be in balance. And you, and the only time that anyone needs to change what they're doing is when they don't feel good about themselves. Yeah. And and that is the biggest signal that we get is, you know, I'm not happy. I'm not content. You know, I, I didn't get, I don't have. You see, we go back to that motivator of loss. And then we do things so that doesn't happen again. That's like... And you're aware of this. That's like me saying, don't think about a black dog with white ears and a red dog house. The challenge with the brain is it doesn't follow direction. It follows words. And you asked earlier, how important is it that we speak kindly to ourselves? It's just as important as we speak kindly to others. How important is it that we love ourselves? It's just as important that we love our children. And you nailed it earlier when you said unconditionally. I had a professor in graduate school, had a doctorate in child psychology, and he said, if you want to hit it over the head, oh, excuse me, over the fence as a parent, you only need to do one thing. It's not how much time you spend with your kids. It's not the job that you have. It's not anything other than do you love them unconditionally? Mm. Now, you may think you do, but they do they believe it? Because if they believe it, then they will grow up that way. And they will be able to be an influence and a positive benefit to the people in their lives because they are enjoying their life and they're not still striving to be accepted. Yep. And that is the biggest challenge is most people don't have a sense of worthiness. They've allowed themselves to feel like they've fallen short and they're just not worthy of wonderful things happening. That's why most people don't handle a compliment very well. Yeah, I think that that message... Um, to teach the next, the parents and the next generation, um, unconditional. I mean, I, I have a lot of kids, so I, I try to spend as much time as I can, but that's the thing. I just have to be extremely present and whatever they're going to tell me, I told my wife, whatever crazy things they're going to tell me, it doesn't matter. Just stand there and you listen. And I, you know, it's, it's crazy. Because I thought, my oldest is 17 and 15, and I thought that, you know, they'd be on their way, and I'm so grateful, and I'm thinking about it, that now they're calling me more than ever. They're asking me advice. They're seeing things, and I'm like, wow. I'm like, shouldn't you be, like, kind of with your friends and doing? And uh, really, I, I get a little bit emotional thinking about that. I don't know what's going to be. Each day I take it as it, as it comes because it's just way beyond my control. But, um, but I know... Well, you know, you nailed it. You yeah. nailed it because it's not... There are people, there are parents that are with their children all the evening long, but are only because they're in the same house. They're not with their children. And they're like, well, they don't want to be with me. Well, what created that? You know, and don't get shameful and don't get guilty. But when you are with them, be with them. Yeah. Like you're saying, it's not how much, it's not the quantity, it's the quality of the time. Yeah. And and I, I can just tell you that the most difficult thing is, is not to impose how you think their life should be on them, but to ask questions. You know, if, they, if you think they're going to be in harm's way, ask questions about it. Well, if you stay up that late, what do you think that's going to, how are you going to feel the next day at school? But you've got to be able to come from love. It can't be a test. Well, if you're going to stay up that late, how do you think you're going to do in school tomorrow? You know, we we have to really be coming with the right intent. And I have five kids and I and my oldest is is close to your age and the youngest is uh, 31. And if if I've learned anything along the way, it's learn along the way. 
Tell me about, you know, because I've, I've really thought about this a lot and I've really learned from the idea of effective listening. Uh, what are the benefits of effective listening? Well, you, the, the, here's one of them. We already know what we know. There's nobody that will disagree that they don't already know what they know. The only way you find out new information is to listen, is to ask questions. And the best question to ask, you know, I did an exercise with my kids since they were little, and that's when I got putting them in bed at night, I'd ask them what they were most proud of today. And I'd listen to it. And when they'd say, oh, yeah, I, you know, I really enjoyed soccer today. And I'd go, well, what about soccer that you enjoyed? Well, I really enjoyed, you know, kicking the ball, making a goal. What was it about the goal that you enjoyed? And you, and you allow their answer to be your next question because it, here's what happens to the brain. When that child says, I really enjoyed soccer, what's the brain do? Oh, yeah, I can see where they enjoy soccer. They've always enjoyed soccer. So there's no follow-up. And if there's no follow-up, there's no additional question, then you don't, they don't think you're interested. So most of us are just going to give people enough to get them to shut up because most people don't think others are interested anyway. One of the things that people are craving is for someone to listen to them, not just to listen to them, to fix them, to hear enough to know what their problem is and here's what you should do, to listen to them, to be interested in them. And even if they're talking about something you're not interested in, be interested enough in them that you're listening. Yeah. And, uh, and that to me is affected listening, that you are influencing someone by saying, I care about you. Because one of my adages is from an old statement, they give credit to President Roosevelt. It said, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Mm. Yeah, I know I, I've said it before on the show. Uh, Oprah Winfrey said, uh, you know, interviewed many different walks of life and number one thing, the human uh, validation of feelings and the way is to be that really active listener, that effective listener. Um, and I know, I know, what would you say, I know you wrote a book, uh, Get a Vision and Live It. What would you say sticks out to you as kind of like the key one or two points from the book? Well, one is, first off, realize how miraculous you are. You popped out of the womb after millions of years of evolution and or 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 seven days of creation. I don't care how you understand it. But you were born with a brain with 100 billion neurons. It's not about can I, it's what do I want? You know, the whole concept, whatever a man can conceive, he can achieve, man, woman. Um, the only thing that holds you back is, is when you say, well, I can't because I tried before. Mm. Try implies doubt, doubt leads to hesitation, hesitation leads to failure. Once you know how miraculous you are, and it's a leap of faith. You just really have to choose to believe you're miraculous. I can provide all the science in the world to prove it to you, to overcome your own skepticism. But the second thing I would say is, say is live your life on purpose. What's your vision? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you go to work? What are the ultimate outcomes you want by being present to begin with? Mm. You know, we all make a difference. You know, our, our whole purpose in life is to make a difference, and everybody does. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what kind of difference am I making? I love that. What is something, Larry, what is something that you're grateful for? Uh, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to, to, to be part of uh, 8 billion that are only here in the blink of an eye. And, and yet, while we're here, we can imagine, I can, I can reach my hand out. I can imagine reaching my hand out and doing it. And you can't replicate that. There, we, we, we have not been able to AI yet, mind, creativity, thought, being aware of oneself. And so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I was born with a sister who was mentally delayed and got to watch what people do when they're uncomfortable around people that are different than them. She was three years older than I was. And I'm grateful that, that I used to envy people. 
I used to envy kids that get in arguments with their siblings because they were capable of that. My sister, you couldn't argue because she wasn't all there as far as her mental capabilities. She she was an idiot savant. She was phenomenal with numbers. She remembered people's birthdays. She was incredible. But she had such a, a, a pure love and a gratefulness that constantly reminded me of don't you start believing all that nonsense too, that we're not all good, that we're limited, that there's certain people that only want to hurt, you know, be careful, watch out for strangers. No, just, just come with the strongest element. I'm grateful that I know how to love. I'm one of the, one of the things I want more in life is to, is to be better at it. Because uh, I've I've been programmed too. I can find myself judgmental at times. I can wonder, is that guy going to stop talking to her so I can get my groceries out of this grocery store and into the car? And I have to really, I have to pause and I have to go, you're in a grocery store. You know, I mean, what are you doing? Why are you throwing that away? This is this is who you are now. What kind of an influence are you making while you're standing here? And I think that I'm grateful that I'm aware of that because it certainly allows wonderful things to come back to me. And what's something, Larry, about yourself that people don't know? Um, they don't know that I suffered from low self-esteem, that I that I never thought I was enough. They don't know that I um that needless to say, a lot of times the businesses we get into are, are an opportunity to heal. Um, and I think that I, I really believe we're more alike than different. I really believe that it's unfortunate that sometimes we size each other up and then we decide whether or not I'm going to expend energy in this relationship. Um, so that's, you know, that's some, not something people, people will see me on Instagram or LinkedIn or, or, podcast my podcast or whatever and and i come across sometimes i would imagine to other people <clears throat> this guy's got it all together i haven't met anybody that's ever had it all together yeah and and i, and I think that we are works in progress and i think that um and i i really thought about this is that every single person that's making or trying to or on the journey of a why and making impact in the world a hundred percent of the time they have a story Otherwise, they wouldn't have a catalyst uh, for the actions that they're taking. So I've seen I've seen it so many times. There's something there could be from their childhood or experience something, and that when times get tough, they still keep moving on because they have a why, and um, and it's tremendous things that come from that. So Amen. it's exactly Amen. those things. But you know, I'm, I want to quickly say I'm grateful for you. Mm. You are a wonderful listener. You're so genuine. You ask such wonderful questions. They're thoughtful questions. They're questions of interest. You're not trying to push an agenda. And um, I, I, I want you to make sure you've acknowledged yourself for the good work that you're doing. Thank you. I um, I try. I try. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, one person by one. We're trying to. We're trying to. We're trying to make a difference. Uh, it's not. It's not easy every day. It's not easy uh, to continue to see the vision, uh, to see you know the craziness of the vision of the things that we want to do, um, yeah. and you know, and when you know your heart's in the right place, and you 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 know, uh, you do the best you can. Some lots of setbacks, lots of here, lots of there, but pivoting and try to do the best. So when I hear that, yeah. I have gratitude, and I want to say thank you for that, and thank you for this time, Larry. And um, how can people? Uh, get your book or follow you on social because um, this has really been great and I we really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, the social presence is is Larry Olson, O-L-S-E-N, Larry Olson Live um, is the social and the website is LarryOlson.com um, and the book is called Get a Vision and Live It and um, it's offered on our website. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's one-on-one -on -one coaching is available. There's just, uh, a multitude of opportunities. If you email me at, um, info at Larry Olson.com, 
I can I can respond to the email as well. And um, I'm just uh, I'm just blessed to have been uh, been asked to be on your show. And so uh, I want you to know it means the world to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Larry. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Larry. Please subscribe to our YouTube page so you never miss an episode. And if you're currently listening to the show, we'd be grateful for a five-star rating and review. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you again soon.